screen. You You're good. Page. You can see my screen. That's excellent. I'm going to make it in a minute. I'm going to, in a second. I'm going to make it. I'm just going to do my best to hide everybody here. There we go. So that no one should, uh, if everybody's mics are off and I've turned off the screen, so nobody will be showing in the recording. So thank you so much. And now let me just. Right, so can everybody see the screen? Yes, good, okay. Yes, you're good. Thank you so much. Okay, so good evening, everybody, and thank you for this very kind invitation to speak, Mr. Bowman, and for uh, inviting me this evening to your organization. I wish everybody well. I hope everybody is having a good winter, and uh, even though we're facing so many unusual challenges. The Santo Daimi. The Santo Daimi is a religion, a recognized, uh, authentic religion. And it is, um, you're going to learn a little bit about it this evening. And what I'd like to do to begin is, right, that slideshow doesn't want to work. There we go. I'd like to start with a prayer of our tradition, the key of harmony. I wish harmony, love, truth, and justice to all my brothers and sisters. With the united forces of the silent vibrations of our thoughts, we are strong, healthy, and happy, thus forming a link of universal kinship. I am happy and at peace with the whole universe, and I wish that all beings achieve their most intimate aspirations. I give thanks to God for having established harmony, love, truth, and justice among all humanity. So be it. Amen. So the Santo Daimi was established by a man known as Mr. Raimundo Irineo Serra in the Amazon region of Brazil in the early 20th century. He was the grandson of African slaves brought over into um, the Brazil and Amazon area. Uh, and uh, his parents had been freed. And he was raised in the local environment, as you can imagine uh, back then. Um, much more than a century ago now. And at a, at a fairly young age, he was called into uh, following the path of the then Peruvian Ayahuascarias in that uh, basin. Now, who are these people? These people are various tribes through that area who for um, millennia have been working with medicinal plants and many different types of plants. Uh, as all shamanic cultures do, they work with what's available in the forest and what nature provides as their medicine. Now, these two plants um, will never know the actual story of how they figured out to take the leaf of one tree and the vine, Venisteriops capi, and combine them in a, in a, in a brew that cook them together and to make this specific um, drink and that they call the ayahuasca. It's one of the most well-known names for this particular brew. So he began apprenticing with them and he trained about six years in the forest with them. And at a certain time, the, the plants themselves spoke to him and told him he had to go into the forest and make an initiation alone, which is a very um, normal and common shamanic initiation. And if you look at all the great teachers and masters, you can see that they all either went up the mountain, it was Moses or Jesus out in the desert or John the Baptist or the Buddha into the forest. Or... So these are very common initiations in all spiritual traditions. And so he went for one week into the forest, uh, just taking manioc water and these sacred plants uh, already cooked together. And he had an encounter with the full moon and with the divine feminine force. And she gave him instructions as to how to establish a spiritual tradition uh, that became known as the Santo Daimi. What the Santo Daimi means is, Santo means holy, and Daimi actually means give me. Now that sounds strange, holy give me, but what it really means is give me peace, give me light, give me love give me health, give me strength. It is a, um, 
it is a request to the divine um, that is experienced through the taking of the plants. So he began his journey. The Santo Daimi is a syncretic Christian religion. He had been, as his family had been, Catholicized into a kind of folk Catholicism um, that was uh, sort of evolving in South America and Central America at the time. It contains elements of South American shamanism. Those are the roots of his training. Some African animism that um, filtered in through his, through his lineage and through other uh, people who joined with him and um, joined into the line of the Santo Daime through the years, European spiritism and Eastern transcendental wisdom. And so it's a very eclectic path. It's encompassing and respectful of all paths. And the wonderful thing about, about the Santo Daime is no one thinks they own the truth. No one thinks that they are, um, how can I put this, uh, in any way special. If anything, um, being a Dainista is very humbling. Uh, it teaches you and shows you how little you know. So nobody's going to get along very far thinking they know everything or they have all the answers or that, that this is the right path. Okay, this is the path for those who are called to it. There's a saying in the Santo Daimi, which is the Santo Daimi is for everyone, but not everyone is for the Santo Daimi. The core principles are love, harmony, truth, and justice. So the pillars are the foundation of the teachings and the practice. Now the Santo Daimi, obviously it spread locally and it spread through the Amazon basin. People started to hear about it and become attracted to it. And understanding why the divine feminine and how interesting that it's the divine feminine that appears to him at a time when worldwide, uh, the importance of restoring the knowledge, wisdom, experience of the divine feminine has been emerging in such a urgent and important manner as it seems that she's appearing in whatever form she appears and to whom in a way to kind of wake us up, uh, to pay attention to Mother Earth and to restore a union and harmony um, between all of those opposites, the kind of male and female opposites. So it spread throughout um, the Brazilian area and our areas around. And then in the 1990s, it, it started to become a uh, a kind of international, have an international presence. My trip up the Amazon was in 1996. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. Central to the Santo Daimi practice is the sacrament. This is an entheogen, uh, also known as ayahuasca. That's a small common name. They've been used, said, in the Amazon for millennia. Now, these plants have been traditionally under the guardianship of shamans, medicine women, and medicine men. And they are heritage protected plants. They are protected uh, under law and considered to be um, very uh, heritage and sacred plants. Even the, the United Nations recognizes them as heritage plants. And therefore, what's fascinating is they are not prohibited anywhere but once you convert them into the sacrament, then it goes into another question about legality. And we'll talk about that and the legal path that we took 17 years to achieve. So what are entheogens? The definition of an entheogen is that which generates the divine within, that which helps us to access the awareness of the consciousness of the divine within. So all the entheogens, the various plants and fungi, um, have had a long history in human experience, um, dating back to prehistoric shamanic use. This is evidence all over the planet. Every continent you go to, you will find this. Now there are some plants that are indigenous geographically only to certain areas. This is just because of climate and other geographical uh, importance. So used worldwide cross-culturally for community-based ritual experiences. Okay? There's nothing recreational about these plants, nothing at all. Um, I can 
use as an example alcohol. Alcohol can be used sacredly, right? Uh, communion wine in the Christian churches, it can be used sacredly. It can be used recreationally. Um, you know, a couple of people watching the game have a beer. Uh, there's a wedding, you drink some champagne. Okay, so it can be used in a, in a social recreational manner. And alcohol can also be used in a dependent manner, an addiction manner. So entheogens are not like that. Um, alcohol is plant-based, you gotta remember that too. Uh, so is other substances like cannabis, which also has the same propensity as alcohol to be used recreationally and also in an addictive manner. So true antigens are never used recreationally. They are only used uh, for initiation, rites of passages, rituals, divination as medicine for healing, uh, traditionally, for example, in Brazil, in the Dionista communities, the Oscar communities, when a woman goes into labor, guess what she's given? Exactly, Ayahuasca or Daimi. And it helps marvelously. I actually watched a woman give birth. I haven't, it's a long story, not for tonight, but um, it is a wonderful story of being present uh, in the forest and a woman went into labor and I ended up with a couple of other women supporting and helping her. And what she was given was a daimi, and it really helped her. So academics propose that entheogen use contributed to the development of higher cognitive functions. Now, this is just simply research, and it's something that different areas of academia has been looking into for many years as to what helped make those consciousness changes. What helped the human species evolve I mean, we can look at alligators. They didn't evolve much since the time of dinosaurs. They still look like alligators, right? There's lots of things that have evolved and lots of things that haven't. But why did the human species develop consciousness and higher cognitive functions? It's an interesting question, isn't it? You can ask me afterwards. So the Santo Daimi Sacrament, what does it actually do when we take in sacred ritual? It awakens consciousness. We're gonna talk about consciousness and non-ordinary states of consciousness in a few minutes. So it awakens our consciousness. For now, let's call it awareness. It awakens our sense of awareness of who I am and reality or perception of this. It provides a direct experience with the divine. There are no intermediaries for the individual, for the Dainista. There's no intermediary. Yes, there are people such as myself, the madrina of a church, a church leader, the madrinas, the padrinos, the church leaders, the, the senior elders in the church. Yes, they are there to hold the ritual, to support, and um, to guide, and to uh, do all the things that are essential during the ritual and supporting the community and the congregation but there's no intermediary. It is a direct personal experience. Now the experience is extraordinary because it is both personal and universal. So one has a, can have profound teachings about one's sense of self, one's life experience, one's incarnation, what we call biography, the story of this lifetime. And it can provide you a much deeper sense of understanding about who you are as an individual and your place in your life and what your life is about. And that includes your beliefs and your habits and your understandings. It also provides a, a sense of what is universal, whether we want to call that universal reality, cosmic reality, universal truth. Uh, it's very difficult to find the right words to describe these things. Um, because it's kind of like trying to explain the ocean to somebody who's never really seen very much water because they lived in the desert. So it's big, it's blue, it's wet, it's noisy, doesn't quite do the right job. So the awakening will also awaken a deeper sense of meaning. What purpose does my life have? What place do I have in my family, in my community, and in nature? What is my relationship? with nature? What is my relationship with community and with my family and with myself? Ultimately, these plants have a message. 
which is we really need to wake up, respect, and preserve nature. And we believe that this is pretty much a direct instruction from the divine feminine. Now the rituals, what are the rituals? The churches have a rectangular or star-shaped central altar. So it's not like a traditional setting, say in a synagogue or in a church where you have the altar at one end and then the congregation. In the Santo Daimi, you have the altar in the middle of the congregation. The men are seated on one side, the women on the other. There are reasons why in the works only, why um, the men and the women are separated. On the central altar, there's the cross of Caravaca. That's the, that's the Christian cross that has the two bars on it. We believe that the first bar represents the, the life of Jesus Christ. The second bar represents the manifestation of Christ consciousness or the second coming of Christ in us. So the four candles that are arranged around the cross represent the sun, the moon, the stars, and all divine beings, and also evoke an understanding and representation of the four directions. There could be photographs of Mr. O'Neill, fresh flowers, uh, crystals, etc., depending on the church. The Santo Daimi rituals are known as trabajos, which is Portuguese for works, and all works begin and end with prayers. So we begin with prayers, and then we have the service of the daimi, and then in concentrations, which are meditation works. We also include singing of hymns, uh, interspersed with silent meditations. There could be teachings that are offered by the elders or by the madrina or padrino. And then there's different kind of work. It's called the white works, where a different uniform, and they are dancing works. And I've been in dancing works that have lasted 14 hours. These are, these are not for the faint-hearted. Um, even the most simple of works will usually be about um, the mass is a very short work that's only about an hour and a half, two hours, um, but the regular concentrations are a minimum four hours, usually going up towards five. Um, there's reasons for that. You can ask me afterwards. The works last two to 12 hours. The effects of the daimi combined with the dancing, the singing, and the concentration or meditation require something that in the, in the Santo Daimi is known as firmeza. And this is kind of a resilient stamina. Uh, try to think of a tree in a strong wind. You know, the trees that are, are growing where there's strong winds have deep roots. And this is just science. And they have deep roots, otherwise they're not gonna last. And so this is something that is developed in the process of being a dynista and going through the initiations to become a uniformed member. You develop firmeza, a firmness within yourself to be able to master yourself in the works, to receive your teachings, to have your mirror cells, which are visionary experiences, to sing, to pray, to dance to do what's called guardian work, to be available to support those who might need uh, some help if they're having a, what's called a difficult passage. Oh, international expansion, um, the worldwide movement, 1990s, we've covered that. It's recognized and protected, um, and not just in Brazil and in some other um, South American cultures where it, the traditional Iwaskara traditions are uh, actually registered and certified, some of the leaders there. It's a, it's a movement that is happening to really support and recognize the roots and, and the traditions. Uh, legality in the United States of America and some European Union members. Now there's challenges with expansion. I'm sure you can imagine what they are. They're legal, they're cultural, and they're ethical. So if you bear with me, we come up to uh, sort of Montreal. In 1996, I went up the Amazon. It was uh, following the International Transpersonal Association Conference. Uh, I am a transpersonal uh, psychotherapist. I train in the work of Dr. Roberto Asagioli the Italian psychiatrist who developed a study called psychosynthesis. And I also trained and certified with Dr. Stanislav Grof, 
um, the world-renowned psychiatrist who is one of the you know, grandfathers of the transpersonal psychology um, movement. So it was in after that that I did a two-week journey up the Amazon uh, with, there was 45 of us in our group and we had been well prepared. We knew where we were going. I had felt absolutely called through my dreams to go on this trip and take something that I never thought I would be taking. Um, but I had been shown that this was part of my spiritual path and that, um, and truly it is. And we were an eclectic group of medical doctors, therapists, psychiatrists, um, social workers, oh, every kind of avenue of, um, and from very international um, uh, countries around the world. So uh, I came home with a receiving, having received a vision in the rainforest too, that I would be taking the Santo Daime home to Montreal and starting the church. So founded in 1997, I was under the supervision uh, for 14 years, which is really interesting because usually the Ayahuasca training in apprenticeship, it's an apprenticeship path, is about 14 years. So um, we were under, our church was under the supervision and the guidance and the development of um, one of the branches in Brazil and we became independent in 2010. Now, now here's what's really interesting is it's an oral tradition. And uh, in the very beginning, nothing was written down. All the hymns were just memorized and learned like that. And Mastery had received um, his first hymn when he started um, the path of the Santo Daime. He was um, shown that he would be receiving hymns. And, uh, and he said to the Divine Feminine, I can't sing. And apparently she said, open your mouth and I will help you. And here's where faith comes in, is that's what we often have to do, is just have faith, open our mouth, and trust what's going to come out. So based on an oral tradition, being here in Canada, opening a church in Montreal, beginning to uh, look at working with Help Canada to receive an exemption, I knew I needed to codify and develop a very strong foundation. I, co I wrote a code of ethics, uh, codified the tenets of the faith um, with um, the support of, at the time, some of the elders in the branch we were associated with, uh, created very um, appropriate for our culture and our, and our government, visitors' information, uh, medical forms and things like that, and organizational norms and standards. I knew I would be needing to prove to our government who we are, what we do, how we practice, and all the things that would be essential for legalization. So this started in the year 2000. I can't get uh, this. And in, somebody's going to have to turn their mic off, sorry. 2006, I received an exemption in principle, which said, yes, of course, we've looked into you and we've done the research that's essential, and now we're willing to give you an exemption. Unfortunately, for political reasons, we got bogged down and held up uh, between 2007 and 2000. In 12, um, in, in 2013, I made a partnership with a good friend, Jeffrey Bronfman, a well-known Montreal name, um, who had gone up to the Supreme Court to receive um, his um, an exemption and ability to be his legalization. And he is of the Unio de Vegetal, uh, which is a sister church in Brazil. In 2017, finally, after 17 years of working with Health Canada, we were granted our exemption. So what are the legal ch challenges? There's minute quantities of controlled substances which are naturally occurring in the Santo Daime Sacrament. The ethical challenges due to media attention and a lot of social media attention, the plants have been popularized, leading to non-ritual, non-sanctioned hybrid use. And then that's where you have your ethical problems, incorrect or inappropriate or insufficient visitor screening. Um, follow up, unskilled people taking it, people taking it alone, which is absolutely never um, how these sacred plants are used. Cultural challenges. Whenever a spiritual tradition travels, there's always a need for an adaptation adjustment to the new environment. That's been a very interesting study. There's a paper connected on our website 
um, about that sort of Montreal from Orthodox to Universalism that discusses some of the adaptations that needed to be looked at. And contraindications, medical and psychological. There are many people who are simply not suited because of medical conditions. Um, also, there are very serious contraindications with certain medications and certain psychological states. People would not be a, a good candidate for participating in our works. As I said, you need to have a fairly strong, resilient sense of self. Okay, consciousness. And we're going to clip along here. I'm not noticing the time. What is consciousness? We've decided for this evening that we're going to describe it as awareness, but it's defining consciousness has challenged philosophers, mystics, and researchers for millennia. Consciousness is a fundamental aspect of the universe. Was consciousness present at the Big Bang, the origin of the universe? Interesting questions. I am not going to suggest that I have answers. The brain mediates consciousness, but it is not the source of consciousness, no more than your television is the source of the programming. It's simply a mediator for the programming. A radio is not the source of the program. It is simply a medium through which you can hear the program. Our brain mediates consciousness the same way our body filters and experiences physical matter reality. Modern science is aligning with the great spiritual traditions about the nature of human consciousness. Frontiers of modern science, physics, astrophysics, biology, epigenetics, quantum mechanics merge into the great mystery. And, and we can see this, those of you who are interested in science, especially modern science, we see on the frontiers of most of the disciplines in science that they start just scratching their head and saying, well, we went down right into the atom and all we can find is vibrating light. So when we go out into the cosmos, guess what we find? Vibrating light. So it's, um, it's an extraordinary time in which um, scientists are confirming what mystics and saints and spiritual leaders have known and shamans and, and medicine men and women have known for thousands and thousands of years. And so now it's being defined through science. Now, there's no recognized definition of non-ordinary states of consciousness. Why? Because we have to have a definition of a normal state of consciousness and we don't really have one. It's, we, there's, we're philosophers and, um, you know, science and academia is still struggling with trying to describe and define these things which are beyond our mental understanding and beyond our ability to truly understand. So here we are, one with the cosmos. So in many cultures, mainly Eastern or indigenous, non-ordinary states of consciousness were an integral part of everyday life in rituals, rites of passages and daily practice. And those of you who've explored as I did um, through the 70s and um, 80s through the Eastern doorway, when living through that wonderful period of time, when Western civilization and Eastern traditions met in through the 60s and 70s. And all the gifts of those wonderful traditions have now become part of our culture and everyday life. Western civilization lacks non-ordinary states of consciousness as a cultural norm, and we just do. It's, it doesn't exist in Western civilization. We don't have a traditional meditation, prayer. We have our individual religions and practices and traditions, but we don't have it as kind of a, the, those of you who've traveled to the East uh, or to the Orient or the, uh, wherever you might have gone, you'll find a huge difference where there's altars at every crossroads and there's flowers and there's prayers and people stop and pray. And, and this is normal and it's part of their life and it's woven into their everyday activities. We don't have that here. Unfortunately, non-ordinary states were often pathologized and they still are. Spirituality can be medicalized and pathologized and that can lead to um, people being misdiagnosed of having mental illness instead of what we call spiritual emergency 
or that they're intoxicated or that they have um, something that was quite, quite popular for the witch hunts. And you can think of all the people who were subjected, uh, were labeled as having a demonic uh, possession through all the centuries of um, interrogations and persecutions. Now, throughout human history, cross-culturally non-ordinary states have played a very important role. Humans seeking transcendent experiences, deep inner exploration and transformation will use non-ordinary states of consciousness. So they will go alone into nature. They will do a vision quest. They will go deep into a ritual where they, with others, may fast, trance sing, trance dan dance, meditate, um, those of you who perhaps like I, I certainly did have done three weeks silent meditations way back in the days with the Buddhists in the 70s. And, you know, as we go further, we see that these non-ordinary states can be spontaneous. People have spontaneous non-ordinary states of consciousness. They will have out-of-body experiences. They will have visionary or auditory experiences or connections that they will call psychic. Uh, more modern research shows that probably more than three quarters of the North American population admits to having psychic experiences. And, and what feels true and genuine spiritually psychic experiences. So the experience of the non-ordinary states of consciousness is mental and theoretical and profoundly spiritual. They're outside of our everyday awareness so I've listed off some of the um, ways in which we can access prayer, rituals, and theogens can lead to self-awareness, personal transformation, spiritual opening, and the development of new perceptions of and strategy to life. And this is profound. This is, we are right now in a moment in our, in the history of the human race whereby we need an awakening. Our consciousness needs to wake up and we need to take better care of our planet and our culture and our peoples and have more justice in our society, more equality, more equal opportunities. All of these things are part of that need for an awareness, a consciousness change. So non-ordinary states provide information about the human psyche, consciousness, and the nature of reality. So our perception of the self changes in the wonderful words of the mystic poet Rumi, you are not a drop in the ocean. You are the ocean in a drop. So it becomes possible to expand our view of the cosmos, ourselves. It also provides an opportunity to transform the past. Now, transforming the past doesn't mean that we can change history. We cannot. What's written is written. What's done is done. What we can is transform our relationship to it, such as old traumas, our biography, the story of our birth. Our birth is our biggest body memory in each lifetime. We can resolve karma. And we can change our narrative of life, the kind of way we feel we're living it. So there's, here's a brief description of the, the expansion of consciousness, a threshold experience with internal shifts of energies or consciousness. So if you were to ask me, what happens when you take your sacrament? This is what happens. Sensory changes, sensations, sounds, visuals, and accompanying emotions. There's a transitional phase experienced often as a gateway, a tunnel, or a breakthrough experience. Sometimes a crossing over, sometimes an entrance or expansion into another realm. There will be states of dual and multi-awarenesses of self, of nature, of reality. A sense of being in a space or a state of grace of neutrality, and that that grace isn't coming from within the inside of us, but it is coming from the very cosmic reality that is surrounding us, even here in this moment. We can have encounters with intelligent beings, uh, non-physical beings, that communicate telepathically and appear to discern one's entirety. 
um, having encountered many beings in this manner, they have an ability to see right into you and there is nothing hidden. Uh, great teachers all said this. Um, Jesus said, there's nothing hidden that will not be revealed. Buddha said it. I'm sure all the great teachers of every, every true tradition have said it. You, you, can, you can hide something, you can try and hide it from yourself, but that doesn't work very well. I'm sure you found that one out. You can try and hide it from your neighbor or your friends. You might be able to do that. You're never going to be able to hide it from, in the end, yourself, or let's call that divine presence God. So an experience of unity, cosmic consciousness, a transcending universal light. So there we go. You in the cosmos. I would like to close uh, this evening's presentation with a prayer that I received a few years ago. Prayer for awakening consciousness. May our consciousness be awoken to serve the emergence of personal, relational, and planetary wholeness. May the commitment of our individual awakening and consciousness in each moment be the foundation for all our thoughts, words, actions, and endeavors. May we learn to recognize the intimate connection among all living beings and honor the interconnected relationship of ourselves with others, with all life on the earth, and with the divine. May our lives promote the embodiment of presence, wisdom, and love in order to assist in the evolution of consciousness of all beings. We pray for divine guidance and inspiration to travel a true path of love, harmony, truth, and justice. So be it. Amen. Amen. So thank you. And let me just...